Welcome back to Read Only Memories. We have two leads that we can follow up on. We have Tomcat's lead at KCOB, I believe it's called, which I think is the news organization that is having their their articles or their their broadcasts edited slightly. So we think they might be hacked in some sort of way. So something strange is going on there, but we also have Dr. Fairlight's lead of Melody, who apparently is someone who worked closely with Parallax. So I think the I think Melody, since she worked closely with Parallax, she seems like the one that's most likely to be uh, to have something relevant that's actually going to help us. So I think I'm going to go and follow up on that lead first. But before any of that, let's look at our poor plant. It's dead, Jim. You were never going to make it anyway, Wilty. Aw, that's not going to help it. Let's actually check her email before we go. Whoa. It's useless after whatever Turing did to it. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I forgot. Well, in that case, let's go. Ready to head out? Mm-hmm. Let's go to the Flower Mansion to meet Melody. Something wrong? Oh, I'm sorry, Nelavanda. I was... Wool gathering. Wool gathering? It's a strange term. I see we've arrived at the Melody Flora's residence. It's quite impressive. But that's to be expected, considering that she's still the majority owner of the Flower Cybernetics Group, despite retiring from day-to-day -day operations at the company. I wonder how she and Hayden first began working together. S sorry, back on task. Is there anything you'd like to know before we head inside? Tell me about the company, Flower Cybernetics. Flower Cybernetics was established in the early 2000s by Melody's mother. It started out developing cutting-edge medical tech, including advanced prosthesis and nanoparticle diagnostic and treatment technologies. They were vastly successful when they, when they perfected the first synthetic nerve mesh, allowing direct connection and control between the nervous system and a cybernetic prosthesis. The majority of their early projects were defense technologies for the American military, developing ruggedized military prostheses for use on injured soldiers, and then eventually, electively, for special forces. This research line culminated in the development of brain-controlled androids as shock troops, long since barred by international law. Melody took over the company from her aging mother, and she fought against developing further military hardware from that point on. She pushed the company to use the BCA technology for the company's original goals of medical advancement, as well as developing the first direct link, virtual reality implants. The company is largely successful on a global scale, despite continued legislative movement against extensive cybernetic use, especially brain implants. Oh, sounds like Melody is a really good person. She steered the company away from doing military stuff, which is very good. What about Melody herself? Hmm, not a whole lot. She's largely private, in contrast to her mother's penchant for courting a media circus. Several biographies of former flower executives show her as intensely passionate about demilitarizing the company, to the point of absolute viciousness in the boardroom. Good. That's good. But it's been a long time since her days of fighting for the company, and she's since stepped away from the helm. There's talk that she's lost her spine in her old age, but... Well, I'd take that with a grain of salt, Nelavanda. She may have retreated from the corporate battlefield, but you don't change the entire direction of a company as large as Flower if you're a quitter. Stay on your toes. That's right, Yannick said that he wasn't on speaking terms with Melody anymore, right? He did, and I can't shine much light on that. 
I know that System 1 worked with Flower to help develop the first operating systems for the Direct Link Virtual Reality implants, so perhaps it happened during that time. Also, Flower eventually went with a different company for future models of the implant, but there was never any public talk of a personal falling out between the heads of the companies. I'll scrape the mesh for more rumors, but they'll only be that. Rumors. I can do my best to parse facts from fiction, but it blurs too much for me to be sure what's real. Okay, let's go ahead and head in. No time like the present, then. Yeah, this person is definitely very, very rich. I mean, this was described as a mansion, right? Yeah, this is a freaking mansion. Small-scale bear statues guard the entrance to the mansion. Rar. What, what does a bear sound like? The statue's head is too big to fit them on. No sweet jams for bears. Aw. Well, I was kind of thinking about listening to it myself, but I suppose if the bear would want to listen to some tunes, that'd be cool. Unfortunately, it's too big and also immobile. And... dead. Can something be dead if it was never alive in the first place? <clears throat> anyway. These tall shrubs could live in the estate of a Victorian duke. They're that stuffily pleasant to look at. How come the only thing I can use against it is an electrolaser pistol? <laughs> I can't even use the spoiled milk, but I can try to shoot the plant. The plant takes the volts like a champ, resolute and green in the face of the pistol's rage. <laughs> so I actually did it. <laughs> I hope Melody doesn't have a security cam outside. Because I can just imagine Melody inside just looking at the security cam, watching me outside trying to put the headphones on a bear statue. And it doesn't fit. I'm just kind of annoyed and put it back in my pack. And then I reach in my pack and grab out a pistol and then shoot one of her shrubs. I would not let that kind of person inside. Windows line the front of the house and broadcast the hints of an expertly designed den inside. How come I can use my ID card on the window? What? It's, it seems so random, the things you can use. A small, poorly photographed version of your face is now directly displayed against the mansion window. <laughs> Why did I do that? <laughs> Listening to windows proves rather melancholy. Leaves you with a lot to reflect on. Okay, I'm just gonna try to go inside now. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Wait, what if I try to use the window? Am I gonna try to open it? The anguished cry of the window cleaner bellows in your soul as you smudge one of the panes. She's really not gonna let me in if she can actually see what I've been doing. Um. Um. Did a polar bear just answer the door? Melody? I'm guessing you're a hybrid? Okay. That's a really extensively hybridized hybrid, or modified human, or whatever the right, right term is, if that is actually what that is. The body's so different, it's not just like, you know, different ears or a little bit of a reconfigured face or grown fur, or like like Jess or something, that's a very, very, very different body. Uh... <laughs> Is that a bear turing? Run away! <laughs> um... Is Melody home? <laughs> what? Huh? Your guess is as good as mine, Nelavanda. Mine says we can go in? Should we? Um... Well, <laughs> I don't think we have much of a choice. I mean, come on, it's a... it's... it's fine. I don't think Melody is going to kill us with a gigantic polar bear or what whatever that was. I really don't know what it is. Like, I want to assume it's a hybrid, 
but I don't know if hybrids can be that extensively changed. And also, it seemed like it wasn't capable of actually talking, but maybe it was just messing around. You know, maybe it's just having fun. Maybe it could, it could talk just fine. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, well, let's go on inside. Oh, Swanky. <laughs> Swanky? What? I've been trying to increase my usage of colloquialisms. Is Swanky too out of date? I'll say. It was out of fashion back when I used to care about what was in style. Oh, Miss Flores. Or Flores? It's probably Flores, isn't it? I know who you are. Yannick isn't the only one with the little birds to chirp in his ears. Curse him to the pit. Eh, um, we can explain. <laughs> okay, so she knows our relation to Yannick. Hmm, that's not going to start us off on a good foot. Because she hates him. No, no, don't even start. If I thought you were Yannick's, I would have just had Pat here eat you both when you came to my door. He would have done it gladly, too. <laughs> Fine, not eaten. He's on a diet. But perhaps a, a light mauling. Look, this philosophy is how I lead my life. Sometimes you eat the bear, and sometimes the bear, well, he eats you. <laughs> well, stop lurking and let's chat. I don't have all day to entertain you, Turing, nor your journalist friend. Not even for Hayden. You don't have time to waste if you're going to find him, either. Right. Yeah, she doesn't know that he's dead. Ooh! Is that like a robo-cat? The most regal-looking robotic cat in the world sits prim and proper on the fainting chair. Fainting chair? Is that an official name for it? Is that the type of chair it is? Fainting chair? You're meant to faint on it? Can, can I pet the cat? <laughs> you give the cat a pet. The name on her collar says Lily. Aww. It looks remarkably bored at all attempts at conversation. Do you want the spoiled milk? If this cat had the ability to drink from a saucer of soured milk, it would become the single most spoiled entity to ever exist. What about my ID card? Want to check my ID, kitty cat? It already knows who you are, and it is unimpressed. Is that a bowl of strawberries? The biggest strawberries you have ever seen are assembled in a china bowl on the coffee table. <gasps> Can I eat them? They look too good to eat. That might be the point. Ah, rich people. Buy things just to look pretty and then let them spoil. A thin string of steam escapes the delicate spout. The handling of the teapot is strictly the domain of the host's servants, at least in homes of this class. I can use my gun on this. The tea is already being kept at ideal serving temperatures, thanks to its automated pot holder. What about the milk? I'm going to continue to try to use it on everything. It's fairly likely you can request milk that isn't toxic. <laughs> Melody keeps unusual company. Ursus Morit Moritimus Moritimus, if I'm not mistaken. The scientific name of its species, I guess. That might be why the temperature controls are set so low in here. Yep, yeah, definitely a polar bear. I wasn't aware you knew the scientific name of the species, Nelavanda. Has my interest in proper nomenclature started to rub off on you? He's a white bear, Turing. What else could he be? A plenty. Have you ever heard of a Kermode bear? Kermode? Um, also known as a spirit bear? 
Or he could be a white phase black bear, or even a pizzly. But he's not. It's a polar bear. Oh, I can use everything. <gasps> Let's try the headphones. Whoa. That little helmet he wears is constantly translating the TV into growls and grunts in his ears so he can understand. Hmm. <laughs> what about the milk? Don't feed the bears. Well, this one's tame, I think. Oh my god, there's so many things, so many things to look at. Blah blah blah. Unit from the emblem on its side, it sits patiently near Pat in a sort of ambient sleep mode, playing light instrumental music. Hmm. Like the high stakes socialite relationships it monitors, the blah 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 is extremely delicate. So don't touch the ROM. Let's show it my business card? A background program researches the Fairlight family history. Huh. Fairlight's great uncle on their mother's side was a chef for the Clinton administration. Neat. I'm surely going to use that information to solve the case. The latest episode of Media Blitz is going into the sordid details of a new teen actor's island love affair with a local politician's daughter. A room control monitor is fixed onto the back wall of the room. The temperature is set so low, it's freezing. Hmm, if it's freezing, then how is Melody still warm? I mean, she has like a really exposed neck at least. If it's actually set freezing enough for a polar bear, you'd think she'd be wearing like winter clothes. Then again, Given how much people can modify themselves, perhaps you can modify yourself to just naturally be able to withstand really cold temperatures. A large climate-controlled globe towers in the lounge. It has some lively in-season plants inside. That's a gardening rom. A Malcolm model rom is tending to the garden. She's got a rom for everything. Rom for music, rom for gardening. huge marble fountain adorns the courtyard. Its pleasant bubbling sound can just barely be heard over the TV and outdoor ambience. I can use my brochure on it? What? Most of the human revolution's arguments don't hold water. Ha <laughs> ha! Fountain, don't hold water. Nice. Nice. You have me at a disadvantage, Miss Flores. You seem far more familiar with me than I you. Have we met? It's just Melody, Turing. And no, we've never met. Though considering how often Hayden harassed me for design schematics of Flower's latest neural implants, I might as well be your aunt. We'll go with that. Wouldn't mind being an aunt, even to a blue-headed robot. I'm touched, Melody. We were hoping you might be able to shine some light on my origins. Fairlight mentioned that you'd worked with Hayden in the past. We haven't had access to any of his research notes, and couldn't track down any collaborators he may have been working with. Perhaps if we know more, we might be able to nail down a solid motive. Well, I don't know if I can speculate on that, beyond typical corporate infighting. Not that Parallax is known for that, of course. Still, I'm willing to answer your questions, for now. How did you and Hayden end up working together on Turing? Indeed, I don't see the connection between your company and Hayden's research into machine sapiens. Oh, Hayden wasn't researching machine sapiens. At least not primarily. Not to diminish the importance of your creation, Turing, but Hayden is mainly interested in developing a way to transfer human consciousness into a machine matrix. Hmm? 
Okay. That just made me think, then. If that's what he was researching, if he was successful in that, then perhaps, even if his physical body is dead, perhaps before then he managed to transfer, or maybe at least copy, his consciousness? Maybe he's still alive in another form. Hmm. You can see why neural implants would obviously be an integral part of that. Oh, I didn't realize. How would Turing's development help with digitizing the human mind? Well, the concept of transferring the human mind into a computer has been an attractive goal for decades. Functional immortality is... a powerful lure. The brain is an immensely complicated machine, and even though we know the right parts to push to make pictures show up, we still can't replicate the entire thing as a technological construct. Even with virtual reality implants, we're really just relying on the brain's ability to make sense of nonsensical signals. The implant is just a signal pipe, and the brain does all the real processing. That's why the acclimation period for a direct link implant is like being stuck on low-grade hallucinogens for a whole week. So Hayden decided the best way to make a machine more like the human brain would be to work in the opposite direction. Instead of mimicking the mechanics of the human brain, he started writing code that mimicked the functioning of the human mind, and assumed the architecture behind it would suit both purposes. Think of it like convergent evolution, two different species developing the same adaptation to solve the same problem, but continents apart. Hayden is a crack programmer when it comes to information collating. That's how he made his name in Parallax in the first place. So he wrote a bunch of baffling, self-modifying learning algorithms and let them loose. Poke and prod them here and there to make sure they value the same things humans do, and we eventually end up with you, Turing. Interesting. Hayden never revealed any of this to me. I imagine he's pretty tight-lipped. You were the first prototype he considered a real success, and he was afraid of contaminating your development before he had a chance to make good observations. Can you elaborate on your involvement? <laughs> Hayden and I have been aware of each other for years, but I can't say we've ever been friends or anything like that at all. It's a small city, and if you're in the tech sector, you're never more than two degrees removed from anyone else. When he started looking into this pet project of his, he came right up to my door and demanded access to the research logs behind our earlier implants. Cheeky. But it was impactful and disruptive, as they like to say around here. He needed the logs to better understand the way the implant handled directing sensory data to the right parts of the brain, and tried to mimic that in your software. I couldn't care less about Flower's patents anymore, so I gave him what he wanted just to see what he would do. I'm frankly more impressed than I expected I would be. But don't tell him I said that. Uh, don't worry. Oh god. Turing. Yeah, I don't have to worry about telling him that. Turing looks really, really sad now. Hayden wasn't interested in Turing's development. I didn't say that. Hayden was quite interested in Turing, even if he is just a step to further research. I... In fact, he's preparing to publish his findings involving Turing. I know it's going to make one heck of a splash in the scientific community. See, the most impressive part about you, Turing, is that you're surprisingly stuck. I assure you, Melody, my construction involves only the latest and greatest in ROM prototype technology. Exactly. You're not off the shelf, but you're still just a souped-up ROM. More or less like every other one out there. Your personality algorithms are impressive, 
they don't require some new space-age technology to work. Hayden is going to propose that human consciousness transference does not require special brain-like hardware architecture, but merely the right software wrapper to interface with the hardware. Much like how you function. Hmm. I suppose that is correct. Still, my personality matrices do take up substantial amounts of my processing power. Wouldn't custom hardware have capabilities that better serve such a demanding, specialized task? Sure, there's still plenty of reason in trying to make a computer that works just like a human brain. Efficiency is an important part of that. But if Hayden can emulate the human mind in existing technology, it means we can start with the immortality now, rather than waiting for hardware to catch up with Hayden's software. I'm not terribly interested in living forever, but there's more than enough people who are to make even a temporary stepping stone important. Thank you for this, Melody. I understand so little of my origins. Well, I'm sorry I don't know more of the specifics. Hayden kept me up to date on his progress, but only in the vaguest of ways. If you can hunt down his notes, I'm sure they'll tell you more. Of course. We'll keep looking. Now, perhaps we could ask some other questions. Sure, sure. Can you tell us about yourself and Flower Cybernetics? This is why I don't talk to journalists. They all want to pry into my life. Can't you wait for my autobiography? I promise I'm working on it. Pinky promise. <laughs> we don't want to pressure you, Melody, but every bit of information we can get could be useful in pointing us towards the individuals that attacked Hayden. <laughs> Alright. Off the record? Of course. Fine. Ask away. What's your history with Flower? Well, Mommy Dearest first started the company half a century ago, and quickly let it turn from a cutting-edge medical research group into a Department of Defense Super Soldier Cyborg Factory. I took over when she got lymphoma, and had to fight tooth and nail to turn Flower into something that churned my guts a little less. Now we're back to making medical tech and consumer neural implants rather than brains inside tin cans with lasers strapped to the front. If the US government wants more war-grade cyborgs, then they'll have to get them elsewhere. Never mind them being banned by the Geneva Convention. I guess that's the gist of it. Unless you want the sordid details of the two decades of board meetings I had to fight through until I managed to buy back a majority stake in the company. No, that seems to line up with what the mesh says. Well, I'm happy the mesh manages to get something right, at least. So how are you involved in the company today? <laughs> I'm not. I, I mean, I still own the damn thing, but frankly, I'm tired. I let the current CEO and board do what they want, with the understanding that I will shit-can them if they do anything egregiously stupid. Like, say, create more cyborg assassin war machines. These days, I mostly spend my time talking to Pat and practicing my painting. You paint? What a coincidence. I love painting. What do you do? Oh, nothing fantastic. Just still life, mostly. I'll never be known for my artistic skills, but I enjoy it. It's very meditative, isn't it? I agree, very much. I look forward to when all of this is over and I can get back to my canvases. Would you mind taking a look at my work? Uh, since you're my aunt and all. <laughs> well, we can play a little I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> it's a date. Okay, so now we come to the most important question. What is the deal with Pat? Why do you have a polar bear? Pat. 
Pat is a prototype as well. Flower had a short-lived project that attempted to use neural implants to increase the cognitive power of non-human animals. Mmm. It worked. To an extent. Pat's smarter than the average bear, but not by much. <laughs> oh, be quiet. After the project was squashed, mostly for being a money bit, Pat was the only surviving success story. The eggheads didn't know what to do with him, so I decided to keep him around here. He's not a bad companion, if a tad taciturn. Give it up, Pat. You're no Shakespeare. <laughs> Let's ask something else. Sure, sure. What's the story between you and Fairlight? Yeah, why do you two hate each other? Well, actually, I don't know if Dr. Fairlight hates Melody, but I know Melody hates Dr. Fairlight. Oh hell, that old bastard and I have been flashing daggers at each other for the better part of 20 years. Oh, I guess they do both hate each other. I contracted out the software development for our first-gen direct link VR neural implants to System 1. Things were going great, but after the first model sold like gangbusters, Yannick tried to get into bed with me. L literally. I turned him down, very politely I might add. And then suddenly all the cooperation between our companies dried up. We've been at it back and forth ever since. I'd be damned careful about trusting him if I were you. He's a snake. And he'll do anything he can to get what he wants. Still. I suppose if he tried again now, I might not turn him down. It'd be fun to needle him about me still having my own company, when he doesn't have his. <laughs> Sounds like he was a bit of a piece of shit before. He said he had changed, though, in his old age, didn't he? But it has been a long time, so maybe he has. Okay, I think that's everything we need to know. Good. I can get back to my retirement. Thank you for your time, Melody. We'll be in touch later. Oh, one more piece of information for you, if you'd like it. I've got the contact info for a uh, Vincent Mensa, who I think might be of help to you. Vincent was working more closely with Hayden inside Parallax, mostly on his company-approved research on data collating algorithms for the mesh. I'll send him a message and ask him to meet you somewhere. He owes me a favor anyway, and might be able to give you some more information on anything else Hayden may have been working on. That would be fantastic, Melody. Perhaps Golden Gate Park? That's public and crowded, for the safety of us all. That should work. Be careful out there, Turing. I'd hate to see this get you killed. I will exercise caution, Melody. But I have contacts that can affect any repairs I may need. You don't understand. Hayden's design uses your base hardware configuration to generate your core personality profile. Each repair will make the little idiosyncrasies of your hardware mismatched against your personality algorithms. Too much change, and the whole thing collapses. You'll have to be rebooted from scratch. So, I'm sorry to say, but you're as mortal as the rest of us, Turing. I... I didn't know. Yeah, I can tell. You really need to get your hands on Hayden's files. There's plenty I don't know, so maybe I'm wrong. I only remember some of what Hayden told me about how he put you together. Just look out for yourself. I will. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. 
So we can go meet Vincent at Golden Gate Park, or we can do what Tomcat wanted us to do, and go to K-Cob K -Cob and follow up on that. Hmm. I'm not sure which one I want to do next. Well, I guess I'll figure that out for the next episode. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far, and I'll be back soon.